Hey friends, it is July 24th, Wednesday, and um, just giving you guys a little check-in. Yesterday uh, on the 23rd, I had just her septin, so kind of finished my fifth round. Um, so I just had her septin and Benadryl, super easy day, drove myself. Um, you know, it's still slow going because they're so backed up all the time, but it was a smooth, easy day. I felt pretty good after, um, though I did definitely get kind of tired that evening, uh, which surprised me because I had pretty good energy afterward. So it kind of hit me a little later. Um, so could be that, could just be that I was tired. I don't know. So Monday was my 31st mistletoe. Um, that's since the second week of January. So I've gone down to Atlanta 31 times for mistletoe this year so far. So it's adding up. Um, but it was successful. We did the um, intratumoral injection and it wasn't too bad. Each time seems to be a little bit easier. You know, it just depends on where he places the mistletoe injection in the tumor, whether or not it's gonna be more sore, but it is nowhere near as sore as it was earlier on when the tumor was really dense and fibrotic. It, it definitely isn't um, anywhere near that density, which is pretty cool. So definitely still changing. Um, I got a really good uh, report from my oncologist last Tuesday. I uh, gave you guys kind of a quick update because it was my birthday on Thursday when I did my check-in. Um, so I didn't really give you a lot of details on what I had been up to, but um, things have been going really well overall. And I had a fun weekend. This past weekend I had some friends over and uh, we did a little like taco cookout and I cooked up a beef heart. Um, they brought some carnitas and a bunch of veggies and we just kind of cooked it up. Um, did some really awesome plantain tortillas. If you guys have never had plantain, plantain tortillas, worth it. They are delicious. Um, Gluten-free, dairy-free. So they were the hit, I think, of the party. But uh, super fun weekend. I took off Sunday late afternoon and I got down to Atlanta and I did the Jeju Spa. Uh, so it's like the Korean spa down there. It used to be $25. Now it's $40, but that's not so bad. They let you stay there for 24 hours for 40 bucks. So it's pretty much the cheapest play to stay, please, <laughs> wow. Cheapest place to stay overnight um, in Atlanta. So I, uh, I stayed there. You can stay 24 hours and uh, you know, I wouldn't say it was my best night of sleep, but um, I did okay. I mean, in the women's locker room, there was like a little quiet dark room where you could go and sleep, but they don't really put the mats out until midnight. Uh, I got there around six that day. So by 10, I was looking for a bed. Uh, and that's when they said they don't do it until midnight. So then I kind of went into a few more saunas and they have saunas for everything. They have a salt sauna, they have a gold and silver sauna. They had a charcoal sauna. Um, they had, my favorite one was the jewel sauna. I really liked the amethyst star and it was just the whole inside was covered with different gemstones, which is really pretty. Um, I loved that one, uh, but they're all just basically saunas. So hot rooms, they have a, they have a cold room as well. You can go into, they have all of the pools, uh, like a warm, a hot and a cold soaking pool. They have an infrared area. Uh, they have like a steam room and a dry room, bunch of stuff. And of course they have a bunch of, uh, therapies you can pay for if you want to be like scrubbed down or do some reflexology. I didn't splurge. I didn't get anything extra done. Uh, I was mostly just trying to take in the spa atmosphere. They had a little gym upstairs, which could have been a little bit better, but it had like some bikes and some treadmills. So I ended up hopping on the bike for like, I would do a mile and then I would do like lateral you know, kind of lunges, and then I would do another mile, and then I would do some push-ups. So I did like a bunch of cycles um, because I also ate dinner kind of late. They have a Korean um, restaurant right inside of the spa, which was awesome. I thought the food was great. Um, yeah, it was super. I just got some veggies and some bulgogi beef. Um, yeah, it was great. It was a super great experience. Uh, I ended up having to work out after just to like work that off so my blood sugar doesn't jack up. Um, but it was lovely and it was nice to be in a place where, you know, in the women's section and the men's section, you can be totally nude. Uh, in the common areas, they give you like, sort of like this, um, I don't know, it's like 
orange outfit sort of looks like you're in prison, but whatever. It was cool. Um, you get a whole outfit. You get to walk around in that, uh, sweat in that. You got towels and everything. And if you don't want to go into the naked area, you don't have to. But I totally did because who cares? I mean, nobody's really looking at anybody. And uh, to be kind of honest, like there's every shape of body in there. So you really don't feel, you're not self, you shouldn't be self-conscious. There are so many different types of bodies out there. So it felt kind of good to just not worry about that. And oddly enough, to be a bunch of, be around a bunch of strangers naked was, was fine. Um, sort of surreal and weird, but in America we make it so odd for some reason. But um, it was totally worth it for 40 bucks and I got to find a little nook. Um, I actually found a spot that somebody had already put a mat in a little area in the dark quiet room in the women's locker room. They had kind of tucked their little bed set up. I don't know how long it had been there. I don't know anything, but there was a mat there and it was pitch black and I'm like feeling around and nobody was in it. I didn't touch anyone. So I just like crawled onto that mat and I used their blanket because I was so tired. I don't care. Um, and so I did get some hours of sleep. Um, so yeah, it was kind of nice and then got up and did some soaking and did some spying and then went and grabbed, um, went and grabbed a little, uh, a little breakfast and went to mistletoe. So it was kind of great. It was a great way to break up, you know, an eight hour day of driving. So, um, I would highly recommend it. Jeju Spa. If you haven't tried something like that, it was, it was fun. It was worth it. Um, my only complaint would be that they have to sterilize everything. So, you know, they have to use a lot of chemicals. So I felt like I was showering in a bunch of chlorine at one point. Um, you know, I've, I've been around a lot of chlorine. I was a lifeguard for a long time. It's not, it's not my least favorite smell, but it's just one of those things I just don't want to douse my body in anymore. I don't want to be soaking in chemicals. So uh, <clears throat> hoping someday I can just get myself a little uh, spot to soak, um, like a salt kind of soaking bath type thing. Let me just get a little green tea. Okay. Um, that's a pretty tropical green tea. My friend uh, Lauren just hooked me up with it. Thank you, Lauren. It's really nice. It's got this really pleasant, like almost um, pineapple-y flavor. It's very nice. I have a peach green tea that also totally hits the spot on the summer green teas. Um, so those are always nice to splurge and, and try, but um, just trying to keep that green tea coming in because that EGCG doesn't last in the body too long and you really want to have it all throughout the day. So. Um, I made a little bit of a list today, so I don't get too far off topic. Uh, so we'll see how this goes. I've been uh, looking into you know, my plan for the next two months. So I've got one more month of chemo. So next Tuesday, I'll have my first of the last round. So three more chemo days basically ahead. And my last chemo being August 13th. So very excited. Um, we're getting up to it. So. Not too much longer left, uh, and we'll just see what happens. So there's a few things I'm cycling in. I told you guys about methylene blue, and I've been doing that. Um, I'm trying to do it twice a day. I haven't been perfect yet. Once a day has happened more often than not, but um, I'm going to be a lot better about that. Um, I just will. It's just hard to do it all. So uh, I, I've been doing the methylene blue. Um, I'm adding in... Uh, I'm increasing my melatonin. So I'm reading a really good book, Melatonin Miracle, and I'm increasing my melatonin. Right now I've got it at, I've gotten up to 60 milligrams at night, uh, which is kind of a, it seems like a really high dose, but it's actually not that high of a dose. People have been dosed um, 200 milligrams and up from there. I mean, that wouldn't even be considered um, all that big of a dose, but it has um, shown some really great promise in the cancer world. Uh, there's been some protocols I've come across that have said to try to take 160 milligrams of melatonin three times a day. So to me, that is getting into this sort of mega dosing amount. But so far, I believe that I have been incorrectly taught in my education. So in chiropractic school, and actually in I think most um, medical schools, we've been told that melatonin is um, you know, produced in the body and that you should not take it extrogenously. So you should not take an outside source of melatonin because in, they say in your physiology, it'll basically shut down the ability for you to make melatonin. Um, that has now come into question. 
uh, as far as what this book is telling me and what the current research is showing, that that was a complete misunderstanding, perhaps blatant lie, I'm not sure. Who started what and why our education says that, but I was always told to never take melatonin unless you are traveling and you are jet lagged. Um, you know, it's okay to take it to try to get yourself back in that circadian rhythm. It's an extremely important molecule um, for overall healing for the cell on the cellular level to actually be able to regenerate and heal. Um, so there's a lot of other applications for it. I've even been learning that it's not just the pineal gland that makes it. Um, so I'll get into more details and I'll do a whole thing on melatonin when I'm finished this book. It has been fascinating, but I encourage you if you're going through a cancer journey right now or you're curious on melatonin because maybe you get more sleep or you have some sort of chronic illness that has been poorly explained to you, maybe start researching melatonin and see if it might apply to you. It, it appears to help quite a few chronic diseases and I'm so far, it's listed almost all chronic diseases I know about, including um, Parkinson's and Alzheimer's too. So there's been some um, pretty cool studies on, on high doses of melatonin, even for people with um, Epstein-Barr uh, infections, mold, um, Lyme's disease. Uh, so anyway, melatonin could be something to look into. I've gotten myself up to 60 milligrams at bed um, you know, I still have that, that deep-seated concern that I'm going to stop my body from producing it. Um, but I, I'm, I'm going to start challenging that concept. I'm going to start increasing my melatonin significantly uh, and, and start introducing it earlier in the day. Um, so they say it would be most beneficial for people to take it kind of like after dinner, before bed, like, but before you go right to bed, like maybe take it more in those evening hours so it can start getting into your body and help you get through that sort of sleep latency stage where you get in bed and then you can't fall asleep for a half hour, an hour or three hours or whatever happens to you. Um, so, so taking it a little earlier in the evening, um, you know, and, and for most people, I think 20 milligrams is probably sufficient. Uh, but again, don't hold me to that because I, I may learn more as I um, tackle this topic that uh, maybe you need even more than that. But I have dabbled with melatonin in the past, and most of the supplements I was exposed to were like, you know, 0.5 milligrams or like three milligrams the most. And so I always thought melatonin gave me bad dreams and that it didn't do anything for my sleep because I never felt like I got good sleep by taking that. But I think what the problem was is that I was not taking the correct dose. I was nowhere near um, the dose I needed to be at. Um, so it, I, I believe so far it needs to be over 20 milligrams to really achieve anything. Um, but there are so many receptors throughout the body that can receive melatonin. So it could really have some pretty big systemic um, effects on your, on your body. So melatonin seems to be super promising. Give it a look. Um, I've also, I got through the book, uh, How to Starve Cancer. And uh, it was a great book. Um, her big, uh, the author went through cervical cancer in the 90s and she had it resurge like four or five years after that in her lung and then had to have surgery for that. And she was blasted with like your tip top radiation all over her pelvis. She also had the high dose chemos. Um, so when it came back in her lung, it was pretty aggressive at that point. And so they did end up doing surgery on that. And she had, of course, doctors that were missing, they were misdiagnosing her for a while. So she had been complaining about this stuff and this doctor was like, it's fine, no big deal, blah, 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 until she had to seek out of their opinion. So things went a little longer than it should have happened. This happens in the medical system a lot. Um, so after she sort of like got over that second bout of it, a couple years later, she started to develop um, uh, essentially on microscopic view her platelets got sticky again and they were like lining up linearly like in a straight line it's a bad sign um i forget the term for that somebody can tell me if you know it uh but it's like coning or something it's not good it's a bad sign and so she essentially was diagnosed with like a blood cancer uh which is not uncommon after high amounts of high dose chemo and uh, you know a lot of radiation, especially to the pelvis where there's so much bone marrow that you are 
just blasting. But uh, in her doctor's defenses, they really didn't think she would live to see the side effects of that radiation or that chemo. So this is just something to think about if you end up getting cancer or know somebody. Um, you know, the high dose stuff uh, is, is, is showing not to be very effective. There may be a few types of cancer that it would be good to hit it with the high dose, uh, maybe once or twice. Once it's in control, start doing the low dose. Um, you can always tell your doctor you're feeling really sick. There's many reasons I was told that people quit chemo. So if chemo is not uh, feeling right to your body, which I'm sure feels not right to anyone's body, um, you know, the high dose stuff, I think that uh, you can make a pretty good case to try to get your oncologist to try to bring it to a lower dose, which is far less damaging and produces far less uh, senescent cells, um, which are the cancer cells that basically progress or, or, or last through camera, cancer. This is like your stem cell type stuff. These cells are created from chemo and, and radiation. So unfortunately, the treatment that treats you for cancer can also give you cancer. Um, it's just, it's just all they have. So uh, if you can do a lower dose, it has been shown to be far less damaging and not produce as many of these uh, you know, nasty stem cell, um, cancer stem cells. So, um, so it was really interesting. She ended up tackling that, la that last type of cancer, the blood cancer, not with chemo. Of course, if she had basically come forward and said that she had this problem going on, they would have wanted to hit her again with um, the standard of care, which is chemo, radiation, and surgery if they can do it. Um, so, so interestingly, she started doing a bunch of research. She was a physiotherapist, um, and she started doing a bunch of research on how to use off-label drugs, how to start using medication um, to maybe stop the pathways that are kicked on by cancer, or how that cancer feeds itself. So. You know, it's basically impossible to stop feeding the cancer, unfortunately. Um, everybody thinks cancer, or I shouldn't say everybody. Most people believe cancer survives on sugar, right? So the most common thing people have told me is cancer survives on sugar, don't eat sugar. It's a really nice, uh, simple way of approaching that. And I know people are, have the best interest in mind when they say that to me, but to me, that shows that they really don't understand the complexity of what cancer is. It is not only eating sugar. There's actually not that many cancers that survive solely with sugar. The only one that they talked about in this book is primarily endometri endometrial cancer that is very sugar driven. Um, but many of the other um, hormonally driven cancers like breast cancer, prostate, these cancers actually tend to prefer glutamine and fats. So you can't stop yourself. Glutamine is the most abundant uh, amino acid or a building block for protein in your body. You can't really stop that. Uh, I mean, if you're not getting it in your diet, your body is going to make it. So the cancer will find a way to get glutamine. Um, ketones or fat, I mean, you know, this is when I kind of came across that maybe the keto diet wasn't the best diet for me early on. Um, and the fear of, of switching so dramatically in your diet, I think it's still important, by the way, for a side caveat, to definitely cut your carbs down, especially your simple carbs. Um, so simple sugars, glucose, you know, gotta cut that stuff down. Um, but, you know, just converting over to fats and proteins um, may have actually been helping my cancer as well. And the scarier thing is if you do dramatically switch over, you could, um, you could totally change the way the cancer uh, feeds itself and you could basically train it, um, train it to find these other sources more uh, effectively, I guess. So that's not good. You can make it essentially say, oh, that's fine. I've got all this other fat and protein I can eat, so I'm gonna be just fine. You, you go ahead and try to starve yourself. I'm still gonna be well fed. And this is the issue uh, with cancer. I mean, you can do fasting protocols, which I think can be helpful. But at the end of the day, if the body, if the body is able to make sugar, protein, and fat, then the cancer is going to find a way to get itself fed. 
um, and it's going to take priority over other, other tissues. So one of the things I took from that is uh, I need to be doing a lot of physical movement, especially around meals, um, making sure that I'm taking uh, berberine to make sure I'm dropping my blood sugar levels or, or never letting them spike in the first place because um, it's still very important to control that but also to make sure that I'm, I'm creating a draw to the muscle, making sure that my body is trying to take these nutrients um, and so that there's a purpose for them instead of it going to the cancer. Um, so yeah, I'm trying to do a little bit more weight training, a lot of push-ups, squats, um, just keep active, especially after meals. I've also recently tried to start shifting my eating habits earlier again. Um, Ideally, the liver processes foods before three, three o'clock in the afternoon the best. So ideally, it would be best to eat like a breakfast or a lunch or just like, you could just do one meal a day if you want, but like middle of the day and not eat after three if you can handle it. Um, I'm working on it. It is not going to be easy. Socially, I think it's the hardest thing because people want to meet for dinner. Um, the way my work schedule is, you know, everything will get changed because it has to so that um, you can survive. But um, that is going to be one of the things I'm going to try to aim for is, is, you know, every once in a while I'll still do evening meals. Um, but I, I think I'm going to really try to stop that eating at three. Um, so another thing with the off-label drug use is things like I'm using uh, low-dose naltrexone. I've talked about that, LDN. That's an off-label drug for cancer. It has been shown to have some links with spontaneous remissions, which is pretty cool. Um, but naltrexone alone has been used for addicts, so it wasn't made for cancer patients. Um, and then somehow they found that the lower dose helps people get into sort of a better sleep state. I think it has more to do with the parasympathetic state. Um, but I'd have to look into what specific you know, pathways it's blocking because it's probably doing some of that too. But I've been taking that um, along with my melatonin at night. And then I'm, I'm going to add menbendazole, which is like a pinworm antiparasitic drug. They give it to kids all the time, super safe. The veterinarian form is fenbendazole. A lot of people use that as well, and they seem very similar, but I did learn that fenbendazole can have more toxic um, uh, toxic reactions with the liver, so it can have some liver toxicity that would be unfavorable, especially because I've had my cancer in the liver, so I don't want to tax my liver. So I am not doing the fenbendazole. I got myself the menbendazole. Um, and this was, I had this from um, my previous practitioner, got me some of these um, drugs to be able to take. I was worried, so I didn't take any of them, but now I've been researching, and so I'm more open to it. Um, menbendazole has been shown to be synergistic with chemo, so for this last round of chemo, I'm going to add it in. So I haven't started it yet, I just don't want to have any side effects, so I'm going to start it on the weekend, um, or at least Friday night. And then I'm not going to do it 24 hours around chemo. Because it's so synergistic with chemo, it could cause chemo to be um, extra damaging to me. So I'm going to not do it around the 24 hours of chemo itself, but otherwise um, take it you know, morning and evening. And the goal for that one is to try to get it to 200 milligrams at a minimum. And some people have taken thousands of milligrams of menbendazole, which is you know, seems like a lot, but again, it's a very safe antiparasitic, um, and, it, and it amazingly stops like four or five or more pathways for cancer to be able to metabolize um, and live. And so you want to try to hit it from all these angles to stop the cancer from being a, able to create food and, and more cells, but also to make it more permeable and vulnerable to the treatment you're giving it, like chemo. So um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to play with that, and if I end up having some bad reactions, I will wait until I'm done chemo as well. But I'm hoping I'll be okay to just take it through chemo and then take it through that month of no chemo before surgery. And at that point, I may cycle in a few other things, um, or I may wait. Some of the newer things I'm learning for the off-label drugs are uses of, like, even aspirin, which I don't even take any of this stuff. I am not big into the drug world. It's just not my expertise. I 
get really bored learning about pharmacology, but now I'm, I'm getting more excited because of the uses for cancer. So, I mean, if it's gonna save your life, I'm more open to it. Um, and I'm not against big pharma. I just, you know, the whole way they go about things has never felt good to me. I, I don't like that they have the most control of our research, and that's why we don't get the articles that I wanna see that are of these herbs or these, even these drugs, they don't even really test these things that they've created because they don't want to believe it has another purpose because it was already purposed for this other thing, you know? So it's just, it's just a frustrating world to be in because there's very few doctors that are educated in this. So you feel like you have to end up doing all their information and research yourself. Um, so that's just is what it is. Luckily, Dr. Hancock at the Mistletoe Clinic is super knowledgeable. So I've been throwing some ideas his way and he's got some ideas for me. So we're gonna set up a whole plan and I will share that plan with you guys. Um, I'm gonna meet with Dr. Teresa, Dr. T up in Marshall here on Wednesday next week um, to also go over a game plan um, and to get her caught up because it's been a while since I've, I've been able to see her. Um, and I'm going to introduce um, high dose vitamin C back uh, for this last round of chemo. Uh, probably just once a week while I'm doing chemo because it is also oxidative, but then once chemo is done, I'm gonna aim for two or even maybe three times a week if I can. Um, just because there's a combo of drugs you can take. The menbendazole is one, um, nicotinamide or niclosinamide or, see I'm terrible with drugs. Um, I got this other one that starts with an N that's also supposed to be really helpful at making the cancer cells vulnerable, specifically to hydrogen peroxide, which is what vitamin C, high dose vitamin C, ends up um, creating in the cancer cells, hydrogen peroxide. So it makes it more vulnerable to that, which is super interesting. Um, so I know that's a lot to think about. Um, trust me, I know. <laughs> There's a lot going on in my brain with it. But um, it's super exciting to see ways you can leverage on stuff and these different drug combos to block, like for aspirin, it can block the COX-2 pathway. That's a very inflammatory pathway. And that could be really, really important and maybe the difference, uh, you know, for as far as like a metastasis during surgery. So, you know, my oncologist was worried that, well, aspirin also blocks COX-1 and that can make you bleed out. But for cancer patients, because of the platelets um, becoming sticky and the other cytokine storm that's occurring, I even questioned her and I mentioned, well, wouldn't I be higher risk for clotting? Um, and she doesn't necessarily believe that. Hancock believes I'd be a higher risk for clotting as well. Um, so this is gonna come down to what uh, your philosophy is, but there are other ways to approach the COX-2 pathway without having to use aspirin that's also having an effect on the COX-1 pathway. Um, and obviously I wouldn't take anything that day of surgery. Um, so we're just gonna have to see that. He also mentioned an intramuscular injection. So as long as I'm okay stabbing my leg, I'm okay with anything these days. Um, I could give myself um, an injection. I forget the drug name of that. But you know, the day before and then the day after surgery and that wouldn't have uh, the blood thinning effect, but it would have a very anti-inflammatory effect. So, you know, it's just kind of crazy to have like your diet and lifestyle and sleeping patterns at your best and your body is still inflamed and it's not your body really, it's the cancer. The cancer itself is releasing all these cytokines and this big storm of inflammatory mess. Um, so it's just kind of wild. So I have increased my systemic enzymes, which is like serapeptase, um, which is made from the silkworm and it helps break down fibrin. And I'll be adding in the proteolytic enzymes whenever they make it in. Uh, that I ordered, um, and those will also start to help me break down other um, inflammatory markers in the body. Um, what am I say adding? I might add fish oils back in. I had stayed away from those for a little while, but um, upon further research, I believe the one guy who threw me off of that path, uh, I just haven't heard his opinion from anyone else. So. They're so helpful for reducing inflammation, and it's not just omega-3s, 3s are important, um, but also omega-7 is super important, and omega-9. So finding a good balance of those to offset the omega-6, which actually has a high amount in olive oil, but um, olive oil has so many other good things that I've been told not to be deterred from the omega-6 content. So um, there's still a lot to learn and research, um, a lot to come across, but um, it's super promising and really exciting. 
So I will dive more into these off-label drug options um, as I learn more about them, and I form a good game plan, and I will share it with all of you guys. I think, uh, I think I nailed it. Those are all the things I had listed. So I, uh, I think that I'm holding up pretty well. I feel pretty well overall, and I'm just really hoping that this next month goes smoothly, and, uh, and hopefully the tumor right now my oncologist really believes it's mostly dead tissue, so hopefully whatever's in there continues to just shrink down to nothing. Um, and I do have a breast MRI uh, with contrast, unfortunately, with that gadolinium, um, but I'm only doing it once, and that is at the end of this month. I think it's the 28th. So that will give me a good idea on the margin of the skin to make sure that you know we've got a good space there um, and that she's not just cutting me open for no good reason. So. Lots more research to do, but I feel um, optimistic that I have some other things I can do in case I get a flare up um, down the road. And I will say um, I did opt to push my next PET scan out. My oncologist wanted to do a PET scan um, basically after chemo, but then, you know, ultimately it sh PET scans are not that sensitive. The tumor has to be at least a centimeter. So most likely that PET scan is gonna look perfectly fine. So why put that radiation in my body? Um, I opted instead, and she agreed. I mean, so she said, okay. Um, I can't tell if people are just agreeing with me because they think I'm just gonna die or if they just think that I'm so well-researched they don't wanna go against me. I am fine with somebody disagreeing with me. I just need to hear why. Just tell me why. Just give me a good reason. Um, so I asked, I asked her a reason, she explained, and then I explained my side, and she said, okay. So I guess, I don't know, I guess, that, I guess that's all good. So not gonna do the PET scan, because realistically, the PET scan, if it's gonna show anything, is gonna be 10 to 12 months after surgery, and that's when um, cancer can grow. It'll come back, maybe with vengeance, so maybe that would be a good time for the PET scan. But instead, I opted for the Signatera test. So that I'm going to do um, toward the end of August to see, you know, after chemo, yeah, it's probably going to be to almost nothing. My blood count will be very low for cancer tumor cells. So, um, you know, let's see what it looks like after three or four weeks of not having chemo. Does it jump up? Does it stay low? Like, what's the cancer doing? And then maybe from there we dive into the specifics of what, what is happening with it. But, um, I think, it's, I think it makes more sense to monitor the blood uh, for the next few months than to do um, you know, the ionizing radiation and the imaging that doesn't really give me much information. So I just want to empower people out there that you can question and, and use some common sense. Don't let, don't let them just give you whatever the standard of care is unless you understand why. So you should be informed and it should make sense to you. If you think you need a PET scan after you have chemo because you wanna make sure it's all clear before you go through surgery, that's great. That makes total sense for you, great. To me, it's gonna show up clear in my mind because it just did. You know, only a few months into chemo, it showed up really clear. So I can't imagine anything. The tumor certainly hasn't changed. It's only getting smaller. So realistically, if the Signatera test is down to 0.04, and where would the cancer be? Okay, it's not there. It's not there. What we need to look at is how it's going to rebound and how to stop it then. So that's my two cents on that. Um, I hope you guys are enjoying this and getting a lot out of it. And I hope it gives you not answers, but more questions. That's what I want is um, to help you guys think more critically about how things are done and um, be empowered that there are, are other routes. Um, not everything is going to be chemo, radiation, and surgery. Um, and, I, and yeah, not everything is those three things. There are many other things. Um, so I will let you guys go. I hope you guys have a great week. And I will see you or I will talk to you all in probably about a week. And I'll give you an update on how chemo goes next week. And until then, enjoy. <laughs>